Jeremiah chapter 23. <clears throat> Today's theme is the shepherd king. And I'll explain that in a second here. Because there are shepherd kings. But there is one shepherd king that's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's Jesus Christ. And he's the one that we should follow. We know that the Bible talks about shepherds all over scriptures. A good shepherd would lay down his life uh, for his sheep. That's a good shepherd, isn't it? Someone that would lay down their life for their sheep. I understand that we live in a day and age where we question shepherds, and especially within the church itself, because uh, there's so much hypocrisy going on in the world today. You just never know what's going to happen in a church with a man <clears throat> that's standing behind a pulpit that's teaching the Word of God. And, and so there's this, this caution that, that we put up uh, because we're afraid that that person's going to fail us. And they may fail us. Uh, I personally experienced that <clears throat> when I was sitting there where you're sitting and, and there was a man behind the pulpit, not just with one, but several, and, and even more than that, where men have failed. And it, it kind of just makes you sink. Uh, but it helps you realize, too, that we're not to put our faith in man, right? We're to put our faith in Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd true shepherd and so if man fails us god will raise up another man uh, to take his place and hopefully he will be the one but again we still put our faith in jesus christ we need to love one another and care for one another <clears throat> and hope that god will work in one another's lives but our faith and hope is not in a shepherd but a good shepherd will lay down his life and and you will see that evidence in his life now if you were at the anniversary this last Saturday, we had Bob uh, share a little bit, and I was really blessed by, by his testimony. Um, actually, not his testimony, but his testimony of me, in, in a sense, because I've known him for, like he said, over 30 years, and that's a long time to know an individual. <clears throat> We've had a relationship with him. My wife and I have been out to dinner with him on several occasions, uh, even encouraging him at a time where he he was going through some hard times when he lost survival ministries and and, and was uh, looking to, to possibly just kind of give it up and sit on the sidelines for a while. And we said, you can't do that. <laughs> You're too valuable to the church to do that. And so uh, we have a, a great connection and love for Bob. Support his ministries, missions, endeavors. But um, as he was sharing, it just it was just really nice to hear him confirm what I have been saying uh, for many years uh, concerning me and I know there's been doubts by people uh, I had come from a church that had uh, been divided and uh, the pastor had asked me to also leave not that I was the one being uh, divisive <clears throat> and that's how this church came about but um, when that all happened I had an individual that actually saw me one day like a year or two later after this whole event and he looked at me and I could see the anger in his face because we had a relationship uh, I was kind of discipling him a little bit and all of a sudden I was just out of the scene and he looked at me came right up to me and says how could you do that and I'm like how could I do what and he just explained to me what I did and I says well that's one story that's the story that you heard, but let me tell you what really happened. And so I shared with him what really happened. And apparently it made sense to him because it was probably happening again. And so he was like, wow, I, I, I never would have known. And, and so that relationship was mended, which was nice. <clears throat> See, I came out of a situation where I was an assistant pastor. I was, in a sense, a shepherd, just like the senior pastor was a shepherd. And at that time, there were people that were planning on leaving the church, probably a, a good majority of the leadership. I would say almost all of them were ready to leave the church, and it would have affected the church greatly. And so I, I had remember seeing that two years earlier, and I thought to myself, stay out of it. Just let them go. Don't get involved. Just continue to do what you're doing, and, and you know, don't, just mind your own business. There's even scripture that says, mind your own business, and I tried to hold on to that. And I remember one day the Lord just so, so clearly, you know how sometimes the Lord just speaks to you and you know it's the Lord? And he so clearly says, aren't you a shepherd also? I says, yeah, but I'm an assistant shepherd. He says, no, you're a shepherd too and you are to love the sheep. That's the responsibility of a shepherd is to love the sheep. You're the sheep. Uh, you're God's sheep, you're God's children, and our responsibility is to love you, to guide you, to lead you, to warn you, all of those things that encompass uh, protecting God's sheep. 
And so I realized that I was a shepherd over some sheep. And so I got them together and, and, and pretty much asked, why were you leaving? What's the purpose? What's the reason? Are you willing to try to work it out? Could you sit down and talk and, and so forth? And so I convinced them. And Bob was with me the whole time. And so when, when he said that, that I had done some things that a shepherd would do and I had to make a stand to do what, the, what was right, even though it would hurt me, you know, he meant that because he saw it in my life. And, and so I got them all together. And unfortunately, at that time, the pastor, uh, I, I don't know the motive of his heart. I'm not going to guess. But he basically just said, you can leave. God will bring more. And that, that was his answer to, to all of their concerns. And so pretty much everybody left. And I was left alone, you know, now looking like the bad guy because I was involved with these people trying to get things to, to work together. And so I said, hey, I'm staying. I'm here. God's put me here. And I'm going to continue to serve here as long as you want me. And long story short, you know, he just says, no, you need to go too. And so I did. And that's when I started the, the Bible study here in my home. You saw some of those pictures there in the earlier days with me as a young 33-year-old man <clears throat> preaching in my living room there. But that's what a good shepherd does, e even to his own hurt. Now, because I had done that, and because it was a Calvary, I had made a lot of enemies with other Calvaries <clears throat> who had known me and had listened to some of the... Uh, reasons why I had lied, that I had left, that were not really true. And um, it's taken a while to mend those relationships, a, a long while. But that's the cost that a shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. And, and that's what I had di done at that moment. And I would do it again for any sheep, for any one of you sheep. Uh, if someone is attacking or destroying to lay down uh, my reputation for that individual. Uh, I'm one of these guys that I like to support, what, the underdog? You know, those people that just, they like to go for the underdog. I don't have a team. Well, I had a football team. It was the Raiders, you know, but I really don't want to associate myself with the Raiders any longer. They never win, first of all, you know, and, and they're always got a bad rap and a bad name. And so it's like, I don't have a, have a team. So I root for the underdog. I root for the guy that's not supposed to win. I hope he wins, you know, that, that kind of mentality. And so I'm just that way. I, I, I like to root for the, the guy that's down and not for the guy that's uh, standing above looking down at someone, you know, that's just my attitude. And we need good shepherds, and we need to see good shepherds, and we need to support good shepherds that are around. So we'll talk a little bit about that this evening. Now, a question before we go on. Who is God judging here in Jeremiah? As we read the book of Jeremiah, you may have read it already uh, many times in your devotions and so forth, but who is he really judging here? I is he judging the nations around Israel and Judah? No, he's not. He's not really judging them. I and you can almost see it throughout the, the lifespan of Israel, that God is always focused on his people. It was always his people. You are my chosen people. You're my royal priesthood. Uh, I have chosen you to be an example, to reflect me. And when you don't do that, I'll correct you. I'll chastise you. I'll judge you in a sense. And so here we see in Jeremiah 23 and even throughout Jeremiah, he's correcting his people. He's bringing judgment on them because of their sin and their idolatry. And so it's them and not the nations his people, Second Chronicles 7.14, we've all read this over and over again. It's a theme of many prayer groups. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will fear, hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. My people, we, we sometimes blame the current leadership there in the White House. We, we blame the rich people because they have all the money. We, we bring, blame the Jews because they have all the wealth. You know, we blame everybody else, but we don't blame ourselves. And God is saying, no, it starts with my house. And it starts with cleaning my house, our own house. Now, that's self-confrontation. That's looking at ourselves first, as, as Paul said to the Corinthian church in chapter 15 there, I believe 33, or the end of chapter 15, where, where he said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. 
And that's what God is telling the children of Israel to do. Look, I'm judging you as a nation because you're not walking right. And I need to correct you. I need to bring you back around. And, and judgment is harsh. Judgment is severe. And judgment is loving, by the way. And we, we think that uh, God is an all-loving God. And He is a loving God. It's His very nature. But in His nature of loving is also correcting and judging. He has to judge if he is a loving God. Just like a judge would stand behind a, his, his desk there and have his mallet and a criminal would come in and that criminal would say, Judge, I know you're a loving guy. I've heard it before that you're a loving guy and so you're just going to let me go because you're a loving guy. He says, well, you're right. I am a loving guy and because I'm a loving guy for not just you but for society, I can't let you go. You'll be judged. Boom, throw him in jail because he is a loving guy. And we forget that. We want God to be an all-loving guy, accept everyone. No, God has enemies. He has enemies. There are people who don't like God because of what he stands for, because he is loving. But God wants to start with us first. Change starts right here with me, with me first. We have to be our own worst enemy. We have to be critical on ourselves in our own thoughts in our minds in our hearts are are we doing the right thing are we thinking the right way is this what christ would do you know am i reflecting him and i being solid am i being light all those questions that we should be asking ourselves but too often we say well is he doing this and is he doing that are they doing this and doing this obama's not doing this obama's not doing that oh he's implementing this and you know and, and then we think the world's going to come to an end no the world's not going to come to the end because of obama the world's going to come to the end because god says it's time the church will be raptured and he's going to deal with his people again. He has a bigger plan than Obama. He has a bigger plan than our own little lives. He's going to work with his people, Israel, once again. That's his plan in the future. And the only way to do that is to remove the church out of the world. And that is the next phase that we're looking for to take place. <clears throat> and so um, look at ourselves. God wants to judge us first. And so he judges his people here in chapter 23, the shepherd king. Now, there are different type of shepherds. There are false shepherds, there are good shepherds, and then there's our great shepherd. Uh, the leaders of God's people are often called shepherds during the Old Testament. These were the political leaders. Uh, these were the ones that were kings and so forth that ruled and reigned over the people. They had the responsibility to guide and to feed and protect the nation that God had put under them. But King Zedekiah here and his officers were failing in their responsibility of protecting the sheep. They are destroying and scattering God's flock everywhere. And so God himself will take action to gather his people, uh, provide for them, and increase their number. And in a sense, he is protecting them by uh, bringing them into bondage to Babylon. And Babylon will become, in a sense, a protector over the, the people until God uh, judges that 70 years and then returns them to the land. So he'll appoint those shepherds who will give them that peace and security that uh, he knows that his people need. And God promises that one day he will give his people a king like David, who will be the Messiah. He'll be the, the branch of David's royal linehood. Uh, unlikely most of Judah's kings... Uh, he will be wise and righteous, though God's people will share his righteousness, and he will definitely save them. So let's look at verse 1. Woe to the shepherds, or we could say the politicians or the kings, who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Now these people, they were the rulers. They, they were the ones that had that responsibility uh, to follow the law and make the law that would benefit the people of God. But God says, woe unto them because they were not doing that. They were more concerned for themselves than they were for the people. And we see that today. I mean, we're not blind to what's going on in our society and the politicians and so forth. Um, I think Obama said it today about uh, the, the raise of the minimum wage, and I thought that was a little hilarious. I mean, he, he, he made a, a good point. I'm not saying it's right, but he made a good point. You know, try living on $15,000 a year you know, a, a, as a, a family. It's just hard to do. And he says, in Congress, if you think you can do it, then I challenge you. We'll just give you $15,000 a year and see how you do with it, <laughs> you know? And so he was trying to make a point that people just can't live on, on that amount of money. You know, now there's all kinds of variables, and I'm not justifying any of that, but, but um, you know, there's a lot going on in our society. 
that we see today, not just with the government, with Medicare, uh, medical plans, um, you know, what's next after that, we don't know, socialism and so forth. There's, there's just a lot. And is, is it all just for the good of the people? Well, it, it has brought about some good, this, this whole medical thing, and it has brought about some bad. And, and I have noticed throughout my years that when we change, uh, there are people that are going to get hurt. And then there are going to be people that are going to be benefiting from it too. I, I've just seen it. And there will always be the pros and there will always be the cons of it. Uh, the thing that we need to look at, is it morally right or wrong? And I think implementing a medical group or a medical plan that everybody's involved with, you know, I, I don't know where I stand with that. I probably would have stand in the, in the beginning with, no, let's not do that because then our taxes will go up, you know, and so forth. But at the same time, one day God will have the, the perfect social uh, government ever. He will be our provider and everyone will get everything equally, you know, and he'll protect and guide and lead and, and, and give us all the benefits the same. But he's the perfect king. He's the perfect ruler. He can do that because he has no ulterior motive, you know, but to protect his, his children. And when we look at politicians today, they don't have that motive, right? What are they going to get out of it? I can't remember uh, what it was, but uh, one trip for Obama may cost like uh, close to a, a Oh, I, and I'm just guessing right now, but, but clo close to $35 million if he goes on vacation for a couple of weeks. It costs millions for his airplanes, for, for all his groups, uh, security, and the places that he stay. It's millions of dollars of our tax dollars. That's a benefit for a politician. Uh, I probably would not do that. Pastor Chuck has always taught us that we are to live at the, at the level of our body. How is our body living? What's the general um, living arrangements in our body? And, and you don't want to live above that. You know, if you go to a church and, and you have a very uh, minimum wage, then you should get along with that type of uh, group yourself. You shouldn't be living in Beverly Hills, driving a Mercedes. You know, now if you live in Beverly Hills and you have a nice church and these guys are millionaires, then they should support you. You should be driving a Mercedes and living there among them because you're ministering to them and you can relate to them also. So, and I believe that. And I think Chuck has made that very clear. Uh, some have followed that, some haven't. And so these politicians weren't doing what they were supposed to. Then he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherd who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away and not attend to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. In other words, I'm going to judge you. See, your responsibility is to tend to the flock. You're to nurture them, encourage them and strengthen them and sometimes correct them and chastise them. Their ways are not right. It's not biblical. And, and we're getting away from that biblical view. We're just, we, we just are today. People do not put enough weight into the word of God anymore. It's all about feelings and what they think is right. It's not what the Bible says is right. And we're not willing to make a stand anymore on it. And that's sad because it's causing marriages to be destroyed. It's causing churches to be divided. And it's causing people who, can, who, who profess to be Christians yet teaching another gospel, believing another way, and it's really not God's way. And we've seen this throughout Jeremiah. They're doing their own thing instead of doing what the Word of God says. And God says, I'm going to judge you because you didn't tend to my people. Now on a positive note, verse 3, but I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds, now that's plural, so shepherds over them who will feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, has this happened yet? No, it hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen Israel all go back to Israel. There's a, there's a good amount of Jews that have gone back, but not all of them have. One day, they will all go back. And when they all go back, God will raise up shepherds, plural, to shepherd and minister to the people his word, his truth. This will happen after the tribulation period, during the millennium reign, when God will bring his church together. Israel will be in Jerusalem, and then we will probably be there too. And then he will raise up shepherds. Now that's an interesting concept. Who will be the shepherds? Uh, I can see Chuck Smith being a shepherd during the millennium reign. You know, and standing behind the pulpit and teaching the word of God like he has been so faithful to do all these years. Or Billy Graham, 
you know, standing behind the pulpit and uh, evangelizing those that went through the tribulation period and survived and now are in the millennium reign. You know, I can see those guys doing that. Now, I can't see myself doing that. I, I just can't. Uh, I'll maybe be an under shepherd of those guys, and I'd be be grateful to even do that. But I can see those guys, those great preachers, Finney, Wesley, and and those guys that just were just ah oh, Spurgeon and, and so forth, who were just really educated men that that just had a deep, intimate uh, connection with God and were able to write volumes and volumes and volumes of books. I can't do that unfortunately i just i wish i could but i can't that's not who god made me to be but i can imagine those shepherds doing that i think of martin luther king and i was thinking about this we just celebrated you know that holiday that we all get off or most of us get off and we celebrate who he is but i was thinking about him the other day and and everything that i know about him ever since i was a kid you know we we look at martin luther king jr and and we look at him and we think he's an african-american hero And that he actually uh, fought for the rights of the African American. And he did to a certain degree. But I think it goes beyond that. And I think we miss that. Because Martin Luther King Jr. actually was a pastor. And he had a connection to God. And I think that he happened to be African American. But I think that he would have done the same thing if, if he was Asian or if he was Hispanic or if he was white. I think he would have done the same thing. Because he had a connection to God. He knew what he believed in. And he fought for that. Let me, let me read to you some quotes of his that really reveal his heart. Uh, one quote is, The purpose of life is not to be happy, nor to achieve pleasure, nor avoid pain, but to do the will of God, come what may. Wow, that's heavy. It's not about living the American dream and having a big house and a couple of cars and going on vacation. You know, it's about doing the will of God. What's the will of God? Ah, that's the challenge. Seeking and praying, you know, God and saying, what is your will? And for him, it was to stand up and say, not just for African Americans, but for all men. Not that, not that he was saying, you need to give equal rights to African Americans. You need to be, you need to understand that all men have, were created equal. All men were created equal. And we were. There is no segregation of, of nationalities between God. God sees us as human beings, his creation. Nothing more than that. He went on and said, I just want to do God's will. That's a pastor's heart right there. I just want to do God's will. I just want to please him. I, I, I want to read his word. I want to be able to share it and, and explain it and then hopefully apply it to our lives. Another quote, when I took up the cross, I recognized this meaning. The cross is something that you bear and ultimately that you die on, that you die on. Wow. He understood that the cross wasn't easy. The cross is difficult and it may bring you to death itself. The early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion it was a thermostat that transformed mores of society society i have decided to stick with love hate is too great a burden to bear darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that hate cannot drive out hate only love can do that forgiveness is not an occasional act it is a constant attitude. It's a constant attitude. That, I, I relate to that one. That makes total sense. I have to be in, in the constant attitude of forgiveness, no matter what is said, no matter what is done. Okay, I forgive them. I forget, even though they don't ask for forgiveness, yet I have to be in that constant attitude, and that's what it is, a constant attitude of saying, I forgive you, because my Lord has forgiven me. He was more than, than just a... What's the word am I looking for? You know, someone that gets out there and is fighting for the rights of humanity. He was a pastor. And he had a heart for his sheep. And he saw that there was a need. And he saw that it was the Lord's will. And he went out and he began to do it. Now, during the time of the millennium, God will raise up those men, those shepherds that will come along. And he goes on in verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will, raise, I will rise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness righteousness in the earth. Now, who is that speaking of? 
speaking of Jesus Christ, who one day will reign over us. And, and ultimately, he is our chief shepherd. He is the one that we are to look to. And so don't look to me. You know, don't look to me. I, I will fail you. I will make bad decisions. And I've said this over and over again, but you can't say it enough, I guess. Uh, people, cha people change as far as coming here in and out, and you've got to say it over again. It's Christ that we look to, and we need to understand that. We look to Christ. We serve Christ. We love Christ. We do things unto Christ. <clears throat> this is on my heart because it, it just it just resonated with me. Uh, Dave Rosales was sharing a little bit about the view that people have of the church today. It's not a, a, a proper view. See, they view the church as an investment and not a commitment or a commandment. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> well, he gave the example of giving. He said, when I give to the Lord's work, he says, the reason that I give, and, and I agree with this because this is the reason I give, and I've been tithing ever since I became a Christian because I read it in the scriptures and I knew that's what the word taught, and so that's what I do. I tithe. And so 10% goes to the Lord first. I'm commanded to do that. And so that's why I give. E even when I was in this church struggling and, and going through all of this and accusations, I still gave to that church because that's where God had me. And I gave my 10% to it. And then I gave it until the day that I stopped going there. Because I don't give it to a man. I don't give it to a church. I give it to God. And God sees that. Now, the people today, our society today, we are geared to look at things differently. We're more like, this is an investment. I'm investing in this place because this place is giving me something. This place is doing this, and this place is doing that, and so I can invest in that. I can see some good coming out of it. I can see some good coming back to me, and, and so it's a good place to invest. Well, that's a wrong way of viewing it. That's the wrong way of viewing it. We don't do that. We do it because God commands us to. We do everything because he's our chief shepherd. We, we love because people love us, and they give to us, and they like us, and they're nice to us. No, no. We love because God commands us to love. We're generous in service and other things because God commands us to be generous in service and other things, not because we get something out of it. <clears throat> My granddaughter, Abigail, <clears throat> she came to me last week and she said, My teacher has, has given us an assignment. She wants us to uh, look at people that do things for other people sacrificially. And she wants us to say thank you to them, but don't let them know that it was you that said thank you. And so she wrote out these little strips saying, I really appreciate everything you do. You know, basically, I don't know exactly what it says. Appreciate all that you do. You do it sacrificially. And I just want to say thank you. And she didn't write her name or anything. So she had this little pile of papers with her Sunday. And she's like, okay, Poppy, I'm going to give, a, I'm gonna give one to, to, to Randy. I'm going to give one to Rosalind. I'm, I'm going to give one to, uh, you know, some other people, in, to, to, to Stephen. And, you know, and she started naming them. Okay, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm not going to let them know. I'm going to walk around. And I'm going to stick it in their Bibles. I'm going to stick it under this or that, you know. And I thought, wow, that's the right attitude to have. You, you say thank you, and they don't even know who's, who's saying thank you. And that's the attitude that God wants us to have, to be appreciative, you know, for what God is doing through, through others. That was funny because Randy, and I knew Randy would do that. <laughs> Randy got in, he said, thank me. Oh, you don't have to thank me. <laughs> He's like, I do this for God, you know, and that's the attitude. That's the right attitude, I think, you know. Of course, he didn't do it in front of Abigail, so he's like, oh, no, Randy's upset. You know, he just did it the other way, and that's Randy. You know, God has, that's why he's a deacon. That's why he has a heart to serve. That's why this ministry, you know, uh, gets cleaned and, and things get done because of the attitude of the, of the heart. That's a good shepherd. Jesus is our good shepherd. We do it unto him because he's our God. He's our king. He's our Lord. And that's it. There's a, there's a song that, that says, if none should follow, yet I will still follow. I'll still follow you, no matter what. If everyone decides to take a hike and go back to the world, I will still continue to follow you because you're God. 
He goes on in verse 6, In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives with, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had, been, had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. In other words, uh, instead of saying, like today, they, they, they celebrate the Passover. Why do they celebrate the Passover? Because of the deliverance of Egypt. So they no longer will say that. During the millennium reign, it will no longer be, you know, Praise God for the Passover, for delivering us from Egypt, but it will be praise God for the new work that he's done, that he has brought us back to the land. It's going to be a greater work. Forget Egypt. That's nothing compared to what God is going to do during this time. See, God isn't done with Israel. God still has a work for Israel. There's a, a group of people, and it's a pretty big group, and it's, it's continuing to grow that don't believe that Israel is in God's plan. They call it replacement theology. Replacement in that someone else has replaced Israel. And they believe the church has replaced Israel, that all the promises to Israel are not really for the Jewish people. It's for the church, the spiritual Israel. And so they think that the Jewish people need to be kicked out. So that's why they don't care about Israel. They don't care if the Palestinians or or the Muslims go in there and wipe them off because, hey, God doesn't, God is done with them because they're the ones that killed Jesus. And so God is with us now. That's why this country and this nation is blessed because God's blessings are on us. We're the spiritual Israel. And that's a lie. That is a lie. God isn't done with Israel. Read Romans chapter 11. Very clear that God is not done with Israel. Now we come to the lying prophets of Judah. Now there are other prophets besides Jeremiah there. And all of them don't have a genuine word, though, like Jeremiah, who was very upfront and clear with the truth of God. These are prophets that had deviled the temple of God, who pretended to be holy, who acted uh, as though they were God's men, but in reality they committed adultery and they condoned evil. They were false prophets, making up false messages to the people. And these false messages were were flowery messages, messages that that, that gave them hope for the time that they lived, hope for what they were going through. They were messages that were making them feel good about themselves, good about what they were doing. They were messages that made them feel like they could prosper and they would prosper if they had enough faith in God and so forth. Uh, Same thing that's going on today, right, with some of the teachers on TBN and and so forth. Everything's about what God's going to do for you and how God's going to bless you and how God is going to take care of you and so forth. I was just listening to Cyril Dollar the other night and he was just talking exactly on that. And I'm trying to think in my head exactly what scripture he was sharing, but it was just like, wow, that was a stretch, just totally out of context. You know, that he would just pull that. It was the scripture where, where Jesus told Peter, um, go, go out to the lake and you'll catch a fish and pull out the, the money, you know, and pay our taxes. And so he took that and he said, that's how God works. God not only took care of his taxes, but he took care of Peter's taxes. And so when you become the middleman for God, God blesses you. And you become prosperous, and he takes care of your needs. And so you can have the big house and, and, and the nice cars and, and the job, and, you know, and he just like pulled it way out. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Now that makes me feel good, though, that I'm going to be wealthy in this life. And that if I just serve God, he's going to give me something for my service unto him instead of serving him for the right heart. Again, that's that mentality of what I'm going to get out of it if I serve the Lord instead of serving it because God's called us to serve. Our nation is sick. The church is sick today. And we're looking for a revival or we're looking for the Lord to return. Is it going to get worse? I think it is going to get worse. I think we haven't begun to suffer uh, we were just talking about this this morning. Roman was sharing a little bit about what Brian Broderson was saying. He was saying that, that I think the church is in apostate 
position already. We've already gone to that point. And I agree, we, we are there, but I think there's still more to go because I think we need to get to a point where the church now is really being persecuted, more than what's, what is happening today, where it's so evident uh, all around that, that everyone knows that these fundamental Christians, the conservatives are really wicked and bad and we need to get rid of them. And I think it has to be a, a, be a little more evident than it is now. And then I think that God will begin to possibly bring a revival back to the church. Because as we are persecuted and we make a stand like Martin Luther King Jr., like Jesus in love and continue to proclaim the gospel, even unto death, people will know. These people really believe. They really believe what they preach. There's some power there and i think that's when god does miracles and signs and wonders and then that's when god intervenes and revival starts to take place because then people start asking what is it that they have that they're able to take this persecution why do they have such power why do they believe in those things why don't i have something like that and i think that's when revival begins to take place and we need to be praying for that for this nation of ours He goes on, verse 9, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my broken bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of a curse, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. The course of life is evil and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yes, in my house I have found their wickedness, saith the Lord. You know, wickedness will never bring healing. Wickedness only brings destruction. Wickedness never brings deliverance in our lives. It will never prosper us. Only Christ will prosper us. This wickedness is bringing judgment on them. Therefore, their way shall be to them like slippery ways. In the darkness they shall be driven on and fall in them, for I will bring disaster on them the year of their punishment, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Smyrna, and that's the northern tribes there of Israel. They prophesy by Baal, they cause my people Israel to err. They're using false gods to prophesy. Prophesy is meaning Baal has given me a word for you. And this is the word of Baal. Well, that's a false prophet. They're listening to demons. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They are strengthened, the hand of the evildoers, so that no one turns back from this, from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me, and their inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. And make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, profaneness has gone out into all the land. And that what happens is happening today because of these false prophets. I was talking with a guy several months ago. And he comes from a Pentecostal community. And there's some weird things going on in that community. Uh, this is where holy laughter, I don't know if you've heard, have anybody heard of holy laughter? You know, where you go to church and, and all of a sudden they just start laughing. This all started with the faith and wealth doctrine and so forth. Uh, one guy just started laughing. He was just like, ho, 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 ho. And that's, all of a sudden he just did that the whole service. The next you know, everybody's laughing. And then so they then tied it to the Holy Spirit. Oh, a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a new work. And so I was sharing with this guy because uh, he had some questions about Calvary and so forth. And he's saying, could God do something like that? And I said, I don't think so. Well, how do you know? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that it, that it did or did, did not happen. You know, I know, you, you won't find it anywhere in Scripture. So how do you know it isn't God? And so they go by what they think. It's all subjective. They don't know what it is, so they contribute it to God. You know, and so holy laughter is from God. And it's okay because God can do that. God can do all things. Yeah, but God's also a God of order, not a God of confusion. And we need to remember that. And so when stuff like that happens, holy laughter, there's also a, a movement where literally people were vomiting 
And so during the service, they would have bags, you know, where you, your tithe envelopes were. <laughs> They'd have vomit bags there because all of a sudden the spirit could get moving and you'd vomit up in, the, in a bag. Well, of course the spirit would move because one person vomits and you smell that, you want to like, chuck it up too. Next, you know, everybody in the place is filled with the stink and everybody's, you know, vomiting up. And then they start saying, well, we're vomiting demons out. Finally, there's deliverance. And so, and they're like, where do you get all that? It's all subjective. You know, it's all subjective. And it spreads like wildfire. People grab onto because they're looking for something new, something to explain the unexplainable in a sense, instead of sticking with the pure word of God. You're safe when you just stick with the word of God and what it is saying. They continue to say to those, verse 17, who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon me. And that's really the key. It's subjective. Whatever I think is right, whatever I believe. Well, I believe this. Be careful when you use that word. I believe this. Because it's you believing it. We'd be better off if we said, the word of God says this. Let's turn to it and read it. That's exactly what it says. Then we're safe there. But they persisted, these false prophets, that, that God was bringing peace to the land. Not to worry people. God is a good God. He's a loving God. He loves us so much. He would never do anything like that to us. So don't worry about anything. God is going to be good. Don't listen to Jeremiah. He's just one of these conservative freaks that's just bringing judgments on people. And we just need to forget what he's saying and just trust that God is a loving God. And he loves us all. And we're all going to go to heaven one day and just have a lot of fun. You know? That's what they were teaching. And God refuted them, verse 18. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Who stand there? Who stood before God? No one has. And when God says it, he said it. It's his word. It's his proclamation. It's his judgment against ours. You know, we should put value on the word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need to come back to the word and believe in the word once again, who marks his words and heard it. You, know, you mark your Bible? Do you have a Bible? Do you have your own personal Bible? I've had this Bible now for almost 30 years. I say 25 years because I used to have another one before this and before it got wet. And it's marked up all over the place. That's why every time I open it, stuff falls out. I'm like, oh, there it goes again. And it's just hard to keep uh, stuff uh, in it, you know. And I mark it up. Here's a coin I got. Years ago, I got this little coin in the mail. And it actually has a satanic symbol on it. But you know what it tells me? If I pray and use this and rub it and do things to it, I will get blessed. And I thought, how interesting. So I got it in my Bible. I'm sanctifying it through the Bible, the Word of God covering it over. You know, because it's like, this is exactly what the, and it's in the Old Testament. This is exactly what they were doing. You know, exactly what they were doing. But do you mark your Bible up? Is it the Word of God that you put your faith and trust in? And what it says and it alone. You got to mark it up. You know, when you read Timothy, I mean, it's, it's woven like a thread through Second Timothy as Paul you know, preaches about reliance on God's word. He's clear about how it's correct, how we need to believe it, how we need to preach it, how we need to share it, and that there's no errors in it, and that it's God breathed, and it never changes, and so forth. We need to be in the word of God. Jeremiah goes on, Behold, a whirlwind of, of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy but if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words then they would have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings that's the whole purpose of a pastor 
you read Ephesians, my responsibility is to teach the Word of God, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And part of that is, is to get them to stop following their evil ways, to not live their old life, but to live the new life and to live it with power and with might, to serve the Lord in a new way, in a new ministry, in His kingdom. Responsibility of a good shepherd to turn them back unto the Lord for prosperity in God's kingdom. I am, am I a God, verse 23, near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? No. <laughs> we live like that, don't we? Well, God's not around. Nobody's seen me. Well, God's right there. He's with you wherever you go. You know, we ought to live more like that. Wherever we're at, Jesus is sitting right next to you. I have heard that the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Um, again, those those dreamers, I had a dream last night. And, and oh, the Lord really spoke through that dream. Really, well, what did you eat before you went to bed? Well, I had a burrito. Well, maybe it was a burrito that <laughs> gave you the dream. You know, I don't think the Lord would speak to you. Now, I, I believe in dreams, and, and people can have dreams. But I think we just need to be careful. It's become subjective, right? You, gotta, you, got, you have to measure it by the Word of God. Well, is it in Scriptures, and can you prove that that dream possibly could be, you know, something from God? Let it be done in order and decently, and is it clear? You know, but dreams, um, I, I've had people come to me, I get them all the time, I had this dream, what do you think it means? I'm like, well, I don't know, I mean, I'm not like a dream reader, I'm not Joseph, you know, that I can give you the interpretations or anything. I try a little bit, you know, looking at it, but ultimately it's like, I, it's, it's a guessing game. And we can guess, and we can even feel, oh, oh yeah, oh, I could feel, you know, bread, oh, maybe, oh, that's speaking of the Word of God, the bread of life, it's got to be the Word of God, you know, and you know, and you're thinking, bread with peanut butter. I was dreaming I was had bread and peanut butter slapped on my face. What does that mean? I'm like, I don't know. Turn the other cheek. I don't, I don't know <laughs> what it means, you know. Um, I have no idea, you know. Stop eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches before you go to bed. It, it's difficult. And that's what they were doing. Oh, I had a dream. I had a dream. Peace, peace, safety for everybody. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by the dreams which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. That's my goal. It's always been my goal to just teach the Word of God. I don't have a problem just reading through it and then stopping and just talking about that. You know you know what he's saying there, right? If you have dreams, then go ahead and dream your dreams. Start your little church and everyone's having dreams and subjectively living your lives. That that's what you want to do. But if you have the Word and you're teaching the Word, stick with that. Well, you might lose people because the Word offends people. It, it definitely does. I've seen it throughout the years, and there's enough in here to offend us all. And it will offend people, but I'm not going to stop from teaching it. I'm going to continue on. And I've been faithful for 20 years in, in teaching it. And Jeremiah is the last book, and I've taught through the whole Bible. And, and I'm going to continue to go through the whole Bible, simply teaching through the Bible. I don't need to come up with flowery words. I don't need to come up with analogies. If you notice Chuck, and you listen to Chuck, he doesn't give you all these outside analogies he gives you other references to scriptures and so if he's talking about teach the word then he would reference probably paul look at paul he'd go out and he began to preach the word from place to place now, he wouldn't give us a, an analogy out here in the world today you know he'd stick with the scriptures let the scripture interpret the scripture preach the word of god timothy preach the word paul said to timothy you know nothing else but the word of god I love the Word of God. That's what drew me to the Lord was the Word of God because it was powerful. It was revealing who I was. I mean, I'd read it and I'm like, oh, Reuben, you do that. How did it know that you do that and you need to stop that? And I'm like, I need to stop that. And then I was stopping other things. How did it know I would stop that? 
And it, it's alive, like it says. It's powerful. I've heard people say that, that <clears throat> they've read the word and it was like it popped out and they could see the word above it because it just popped out at them, a certain phrase, and just convicted them of their sins or so forth. Because it is alive. It's powerful. What is the shaft to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Boy, it can do that sometimes, huh? <laughs> the word of God can really crush us. It really can. Because yeah, it reveals our hearts. I won't go there, never mind. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, like a hammer breaking rocks in peace. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets who, who say the Lord who uses their tongues and says he says. You know, it's interesting how liberal theologians, and there are liberal shepherds and pastors or theologians out there who minimize the word of god they'll tell you what to believe and not to believe they'll tell you you can't trust in the epistles i've heard them say that you only can trust in the gospels the epistles are not canon they're not of god paul and peter these guys just wrote them down from their perspective you can't believe that it's 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 from god himself and you don't really need to pay attention or follow after them and then they said, it's the Gospels. Oh, and by the way, it's only the, the, the words of Jesus, not the other parts of the Gospels. And it's only the words of Jesus, and, and, and not all the words, just some of the words. And so by the time they're done, they have a few words like, God is love. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he said that one, you know, but not judgment. No, he would never say that. He would never say judge. You know? And they're liberals, and they minimize the word of God, and people believe it. Well, we can't trust in the word of God. It's written by a bunch of guys. We have theologians telling us this. They're false prophets. They're lying. Can't believe in that. Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell, and tell them, Jeremiah, and cause my people to err their, by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them, Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So when these people or the prophet or the priest ask you, saying, what is the oracle of the Lord? You shall say to them, what oracle? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priests and the people who say the oracle of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Thus Every one of you shall say to his neighbor and every one to his brother, what has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the article of the Lord you shall mention no more for every man, man's word will be in his article for you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you shall say to the prophet, what has the Lord answered you and what has the Lord spoken? But since you say the oracle of the Lord, therefore thus says the Lord, because you say this word, the oracle of the Lord, and I have sent to you saying, do not say the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and forsake you and the city that I give you and your fathers and will cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and the perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. In other words, what, what God was telling Jeremiah is that these prophets are going, in the name of God, this is what God is saying. And just because someone says, in the name of God, don't listen to them. Because you can say, in the name of God, and say it. And you could say, I believe in God. Someone say, yeah, I know God, and I'm going to heaven. Okay. But let's define that more. Do you know Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I know Jesus Christ. He's a man, and he came to this earth to give us moral values. No. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he is Lord? No, I don't believe he's God. Then you don't know God, and you can say in the name of God all you want, but you don't know God, not according to the word of God. It is a different God, a different God. And God says, don't listen to them. I will not listen to them and I'll cast them out and there'll be utter shame. We live in that world today. Here's Jeremiah 
preaching the message to the people, and yet it's so similar for us today, isn't it? It sure is. And unfortunately, it's even within our own church, the struggles that we have with believing what the Word of God says. Do you know that if this church itself, right here, I mean, we're only, if everybody came, if everybody came to church like the Word of God said they should, you know, on a Sunday morning, now I understand you have to go to work and other things may happen, but if the 150 to 175 did come, you know, and we did what the Word of God said, this place would be growing. This place would be doing greater and bigger things. It really would. It really would. And it all depends on us and how much we want to do. How much we want to be faithful to the Word of God. How much we want to believe in the Word of God. Um, it starts with us first. Revival will start here with us, with you, with me, and it will grow and grow and go into the other parts of the city and the other parts of California. And that's how it works. That's how it always works and it will never change as long as we put God first in our lives and we serve him and follow his word he will bless us he promised that he promises that to us